sole presenting company in track A, TAP Immune, which is traded on the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol TPIV. TAP Immune, as you can probably surmise, is focused on the immuno-oncology space and in particular uh, has a focus on uh, unique and proprietary sets of peptide antigens designed to elicit both killer T cell CD8 and helper T cell CD4 immune responses against well-characterized molecular targets that correlate with disease prognosis. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Peter Huang, Chief Executive Officer. Thank you very much, and thanks for joining me here this afternoon. I think that we've got some uh, some very exciting data to talk to you about that I think is very important for the field. So let's first start with uh, our forward-looking statements. Um, we're a publicly traded company, and so I encourage you to uh, to refer to our public filings for the associated risk factors. But here, I'd like to talk to you about the merger that we've announced uh, on the 15th of May. Uh, that we are acquiring marker therapeutics and what I think is a really transformative cell therapy program. And this cell therapy program I think is unique and highly differentiated in that I think that it is one of the only ways um, for us to be able to commercially reasonably uh, target multiple target antigens with a single uh, cell therapy approach and in the meantime generate significant epitope spreading, that is participation by endogenous T cells. Our approach requires no modification of, of T cells with an expensive virus or transposon based approach and moreover I think that what I'd like to focus you on today is that I think that we are generating extremely robust clinical responses with superior durability to other cell therapy approaches while seeing virtually no toxicity to date in the patients that we've treated. So for the most part, I'm going to skip over the, the background setting. We've spent a lot of time today within the panels talking about many of the limitations that we've identified in the clinical experience of CAR and TCR programs over the last few years. And I think that for most of us, the top 10 list of challenges is, is pretty clear in terms of inconsistent uh, response rates, lack of durability in those complete responses when they occur, the clinical safety concerns that come associated with that, whether those are CRS, neurotoxicity, or other events. And remember that the clinical safety concerns go well beyond um, just safety events within the clinic. That is that if we gene modify a T cell today, the FDA mandates that we monitor that patient for 15 years, which can be a very expensive proposition. Moreover, the challenge of CAR T's today revolves around the high uh, complexity and the high cost of manufacturing. These T cell therapies typically cost $75,000 to $125,000 to produce a single patient dose. And that because of the toxicity profile of these T cells, many times we're forced to use uh, treatments like tocilizumab and steroids to manage those toxicities, which adds to the overall cost of therapy. Well, I think that the, the therapy that I'm going to introduce to you today may be able to address all of those concerns. Going to the, the genesis of this technology, the first patients using this technology were, were infused by Baylor College of Medicine scientists back in 2011, uh, far, far earlier than the inception of many current CAR T cell programs. And even then, prior to the evidence that we have today of antigen negative escape, what we knew is that so long as you target with a single antigen, even if you're able to do complete killing of the tumor that expresses those antigens, we know that the tumors express antigens in a heterogeneous manner. That is that each tumor cell expresses different antigens, and they express those antigens at different intensity levels. And so, so long as we're able to only target a single antigen, we know that we will have residual disease that will then grow out and uh, cause the patient to relapse. And it's only with a multi-tumor approach, a multi-antigen approach uh, to T-cell therapy that we can do complete tumor cell killing up front. Now, many of you have seen the, the paper that was put out by Memorial Sloan Kettering, authored by Jay Park and Michelle Sadlane uh, two months ago. 
And there, I think that that very much supports the findings of the field, which is that if you follow ALL patients, who we generated originally a 90% complete response rate in, if you follow them for five and six years, that generally those patients continue to lose those complete remissions uh, until five years later, where they plateau at about 20%. And contrary to the dogma of the field, what you find is that those patients that hold their complete response longest tend to be highly correlated with patients that have low tumor burdens. That is, and the hypothesis that was presented by the researchers at Memorial Sloan Kettering were that the reason that the low tumor burden patients seem to be outperforming the high tumor burden patients over time is that the, in the low tumor burden patients, the, the therapies were able to do more complete tumor cell killing up front. And that's very consistent with what we see in CAR T therapies, where if we hit a tumor sequentially with CD19 and then CD20, or CD22 and then CD20, what you'll see is sequential escapes. So that you'll see CD19 negative escape, then CD22 negative escape, and CD20 negative escape. Whereas if you hit all of them, if you hit the tumor with all of them at the same time, you are much less likely to see an antigen negative escape. So the quality of the tumor killing up front is important. And so how do, we, how do we manufacture our process without gene-modifying T cells? Well, today we have two products, one which is a donor-derived product for AML, one which is an autologous product for lymphoma and multiple myeloma. And the, the really startling thing here is that we're able to generate these therapeutic responses with an extraordinarily low dose of cells. That is that the standard dose in lymphoma for a patient is Two, uh, is 20 million cells per meter squared. That's right, per meter squared, not per kilogram. Coming from the CAR-T world, I am used to typically dosing a patient with upwards of five, 10, and 20 billion T cells. But for an adult patient, we are generally using 20 million T cells. For a very large patient, 40 million T cells. So what that allows us to do is to do blood draw by venipuncture rather than having to send a patient to an apheresis center and hook them up to an apheresis machine in a painful process that requires several hours to draw blood. We, in fact, with venipuncture, all we need is 100 to 400 mils of blood, eight green tubes. Then we manufacture them. We manufacture these cells in a single G-Rex device. It's a plastic container that I will show you in a minute, where we mix the PBMCs with dendritic cells, our our peptide, uh, our pep mix, and a mix of cytokines intended to revive these T cells to function. So, what is the pep mix? The pep mix is actually a multi-antigen pep mix. So what we do is for AML, we take WT1, Prem, Survivin, and ESO1 for, for uh, lymphoma and myeloma, MAJ4, Prem, NYESO1, SSX2, and Survivin. Take the entire protein length of that particular antigen. So for example, in NYESO1, you'll take the entire protein length of NYESO1 and carve it up into very small overlapping peptides. That is 15 mer peptides overlapping by 11 amino acids. And what that allows us to do is to basically select for every T cell that is specific to any peptide epitope of NYESO1 along with four other tumor-associated antigens. In fact, what we see in the process is that we're able to expand very rare clones that are disproportionately important. In our correlative studies, we can show that those clones that were very rare are particularly important contributors to the anti-tumor effect. And those clones are so rare that when we deep sequence the peripheral blood, those clones fall below the threshold of detection by deep sequencing. We do two stimulations. We wash and freeze the cells, and then we reintroduce it into the patient. Because we need such a small dose of cells, this is a two mil infusion. It can be done in 10 minutes. And because we've never seen toxicity in the 60 patients that we've dosed to date, we're able to do this on an outpatient basis. The patient can come into an outpatient center, get a 10-minute infusion, and be out in, in, in an hour or less. And that, that is very different from a CAR-T program where you will have to hospitalize that patient overnight with an IT, ICU team standing by in case that patient sees severe toxicity. But let's talk about the results that we see from that. And here, I'm gonna say that these results, I think, are very compelling. In lymphoma, we see 55% complete response rate in patients. Those patients that did not register a complete response registered stable disease. In fact, I'll show you in a few minutes that those patients continue with stable disease and do not see disease progression 
in most cases for longer than patients who develop a partial response to a CD19 car. In AML, we've derived therapeutic benefit for 80% of the patients with active AML post-transplant with relapse. Those are patients who are inaccessible to current CAR-T approaches. And in multiple myeloma, where we do, uh, where we introduce ourselves in conjunction with an autologous stem cell transplant, we're, we've seen the ability uh, to generate complete responses in, in patients who have residual active disease after transplant. But let's talk about those patients. So, you know, what, what we've tried to do here, because this program has flown under the radar at Baylor um, in stealth mode, is that we've tried to give you a more comprehensive look at these patients than any CAR T cell program has disclosed to date. And so here, for every patient who's been dosed with our T cells, I've given you all of the prior lines of therapy, their duration of response after first line therapy, and their response and the durability of that response. And here, I think that these results are compelling. First of all, I'm gonna note that patients one, three, seven, 10, and 12, Look at how refractory those patients are. These patients have failed upwards of nine prior lines of therapy. It's very hard because the CAR-T uh, companies don't disclose how many lines of prior therapy, but in our, in our conversations with KOLs who have been involved with those trials, we think that it's typical that a typical CAR-19 patient has failed three prior lines of therapy. These patients are extraordinarily fragile. These patients are in terrible condition. In fact, many of these patients, including all of the patients who, were, uh, who eventually progressed, the three patients who eventually progressed, were dosed in many cases because they failed all the other therapies at Baylor and we gave them the cells as a humanitarian gesture rather than because we thought that they were gonna to respond to therapy. The most amazing thing for me about these results is not the level of response and the duration of response we get, but given the fragility of these patients that we got any response at all. But if you look at these patients, look at this. This is a patient with mixed Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and you've got a CR. This is, the only pay, this is the only complete responder that we've ever lost. We've never lost a complete responder to disease relapse, not one. And this patient was lost to an unrelated pneumonia four months later. Patient number three, ongoing in, in complete remission, two plus years. Patient number four, ongoing in complete remission, over a year. Patient number five, who I'm going to show you in a second, is now, uh, actually, we, we mark him durable out beyond two years. Um, that patient, I'm told, has just come in for his three-year follow-up. That patient is getting complete response now over three years, as is patient number six, um, all of whom I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Um, but once again, remember that the patients that progressed here and many of the patients who did respond to our, our therapy here were so refractory that they would clearly have fallen outside of the inclusion criteria for any commercial CAR-19 trial. Moreover, it's easy to think about this as being a therapy in, in contrast to CAR-T alone, but what I'm gonna tell you is that you've gotta think about this as a, as a cell therapy in its own right, in that with low cost of goods, that is that today, manufacturing up to 10 patient doses in a single G-Rex, Baylor estimates that its cost of goods is $8,000. And the lack of toxicity and the persistence of these T cells. Remember, because this is not a gene modified T cell, once you lose the last gene modified T cell, your therapy is gone. But these are natural T cells. So in the in the lack of antigen, what these T cells do is they retreat into memory state and they provide ongoing protection for the patient, which is one of the reasons that we see such long and durable responses. But because of that profile, lower cost, better persistence and no toxicity, these therapies can be used in much earlier lines of treatment. In fact, these patients that I'm gonna show you here were treated in remission, these cells being used as a maintenance therapy. And so, you know, obviously with a phase one, it's very hard to make any conclusions about efficacy, except I'll say this. Baylor did a retrospective analysis of these patients, these patients being highly refractory, and they looked at the best remission that these patients had ever seen previously. And if you take an average of those best remissions, it's four months. The best remission that these patients had ever seen prior to these therapies, four months on average. And if you look at the length of time that these patients have been in continuing complete remission with these T cells alone, 37 months, 17 months, 29 months, 16 months, 25 months, 28 months, 20 months, 15 months, 18 months, what we can say definitively is that for 
every one of the patients that was assessed in that retrospective analysis, we have generated by far the longest continuing complete remission that those patients have ever seen. I think that the Baylor clinicians can put their hand to their heart and say, look, it's not statistical, but from a gut feel perspective, there is no way that these patients should be in continuing complete remission absent these T cells. So let's look at some of the patients. So this is patient number five, durable out beyond three years now in complete remission. This is a Hodgkin's lymphoma patient. You can see that the tumor spot pre-infusion is completely resolved. His SUV went from 5.7 to less than two, clearly putting him in complete response. And here you can see that prior to infusion of our T cells, that this patient has very few circulating T cells specific for the tumor associated antigens we infuse. Now. After the infusion, what you see is that this tumor was a particularly high expressor with SSX2 and NYESO1, and you see profound expansion of those T cells. But here's the magic. This is what every other CAR T and TCR company is spending an enormous amount to try to reproduce, but no one has yet been able to show. I will show you that we consistently generate epitope spreading in our patients. So here, you see substantial expansion of, of MAGE-C1 and MAGE-A3 specific T cells. We did not put those in the patient. We're, our T cells are starting a fire that is spreading to the endogenous immune system. It is turning a previously immunosuppressive environment through inflammation and exposure of antigen into a, an environment that is recruiting the endogenous immune system to take part, and this is what is driving long-term durable responses. By the way, WT1 is a nice negative control here. WT1 is not on tumor. So we can show that we are not expanding T cells that are not specific for the tumor. I'm gonna remind you of the, the results that we've seen here. 55% complete response rates, durability out beyond two years for half of our complete responders. No complete responder lost to disease relapse. And what the context that you have to put that in is that many of these lymphoma patients did not actually receive the full product. So when we started infusing patients in 2011, the FDA was concerned enough about a multi-antigen product that they forced us to antigen escalate. That is, that they forced us to start two patients with a single antigen product, wait six weeks, then dose two more patients with two antigen product. It took us almost a year to escalate to the full product. Patient number two is the one with the mixed Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And here you can see that this patient only got T cells for Prame and SSX2. Thankfully, this tumor was a high expressor in both, and you see significant expansion of both the Prame and SSX2 specific T cells. But here, when you see the NYESO1 and MAJ4 specific T cells expanding, that's epitope spreading. We didn't put those T cells in the patient along with MAJ3, MAJ1, and alpha feta protein. Once again, WT1's a nice negative control in that we don't see expansion of the WT1 T cells. Now, let's talk about the kinetics of this. So one of the reasons we get epitope spreading is that we don't lymphodeplete. Cyclophosphamide and fludarabine have been critical for CAR-Ts because without them, there's no expansion, and without expansion, there is no efficacy. Our cells in craft perfectly fine without lymphodepletion. And that, I think, is contributing to epitope spreading. Because look, if you kill off 99% of your lymphocytes, you can't expect them to join in the fight. We don't. And so one, we see a much gentler expansion of our T cells as they engraft. And we see many of our con patients convert later than CAR-T patients. So in this case, this patient converted uh, to a CR after month three. So what you see in the PET scan here is that this tumor at month three looks, if anything, larger. But you know, that's a well-known phenomenon of tumor inflammation. That, that, that tumor's chock full of T cells, which you can see in the bar graph here. Now, the clinicians, believing that that was tumor inflammation, chose to do nothing. And you can see that by month nine, that tumor is entirely resolved. Well, here is the important thing about our product. So you can see that at month three, the expansion of the T cells is driven primarily towards Prame and NYESO1. So that tumor is a high expressor in Prame and ESO1. But like we would expect, as we kill down tumor that is expressing ESO1 and Prame, you should see that tumor migrate away from it. And if this was a Prame or an NYESO1 TCR alone, I think it's highly likely that we would have lost this patient. But we didn't, why? Because as that tumor migrated towards MAJ4 and Survivin and SSX2, we see our product migrate alongside it. And so we see expansion of those T cells, and so by month nine, 
we see elimination of that, uh, of that tumor. And once again, this patient is durable in complete remission over three years. Once again, we see significant participation by endogenous T cells, in this case, by an oligoclonal clonal response to MageC1. By the way, in our product, we typically see 4,000 different clonotypes of T cells across over 400 epitopes of the five tumor-associated antigens that we target. Here, we've just done an illustrative comparison against the largest uh, population of, of patients in lymphoma that's ever been reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, December 2012, uh, 2017. 101 patients reported by Kite. You can see that our complete response rate falls very nicely on top of theirs, 55% to their 54%. But what you see here is very consistent with what's been reported uh, by other CAR-T companies as well, which is that typically we lose 30 to 40% of those complete responders within the first year. The line does flatten out beyond that, but I'm gonna remind you that most of these patients are in the month one to month 12 timeframe, and so there's every opportunity for this Kaplan-Meier to continue to tick down over time. Once you get out to 23 months, Kite has only one complete responder that's aged out to 23 months, none longer. Remember that half of our complete responders are, are durable out beyond the longest complete responder that Kite can report to date. So while Kite has a larger data set, in many ways, the marker data set is more mature. And this comes with a 95% rate of severe adverse events associated with their therapy. To date, like I said, we've had one reportable event of a grade three adverse event that was potentially related to our therapy. And remember that these adverse events are very serious. CRS is only 13% of these. 79% of these patients get grade three or higher neutropenia. 28% of them, almost one in three, gets a grade three or higher neurotoxicity. And, a neuro and neurotoxicity with just four patient fatalities was fatal to JCAR 013, uh, 015, JCAR's uh, first in man uh, CAR-T uh, for CD19. Here's our Kaplan-Meier. We've never lost a complete responder to disease relapse. And once again, if you look at the patients for whom we only develop stable disease, they go considerably longer before seeing disease relapse than Kite's partial responders. But those aren't the most exciting results. They're just the most comparable results. Where I think that we can really make an impact is in AML. So in post-relapse, uh, post-transplant relapsed AML, there's no currently available therapy other than a DLI. FLT3 inhibitors, IDH inhibitors are all approved pre-transplant. CAR-Ts like CD123 and 33 can only be used pre-transplant because, because those targets are in hemopoietic stem cells. So if you use a CD123 CAR, and you know you can't live without your hemopoietic stem cells. You have to wipe out those stem. Uh, you have to wipe out the CAR T at some point after it's had its anti-tumor effect, and you have to transplant the patient. If a patient relapses post-transplant, their prognosis is extre is extremely dire. Their overall survival expectation is four and a half months. I'm going to show you the five patients that we've dosed in post-transplant relapsed. Uh, AML, and you'll see that four out of five of them have had significant therapeutic benefit. The first patient went out to his survival expectation, stable disease, and saw isolated relapse only in the skin, did not see a relapse in the marrow, which is what AML is. It's a marrow disease. So that, that relapse was treated topically. In the marrow, that patient continues in stable disease today. We did see one progressor who passed away after two months, but then we have a complete responder who's durable now out to 15 months. 15 months, that is unheard of um, in post-transplant relapsed AML. This patient who saw partial, re uh, re partial remission saw a reduction in blast count from 40 to 15%, restoration of normal hemopoiesis. He had no normal hemopoiesis and did so well that his clinician elected to take him to a second transplant that put him into a CR. Likewise, um, this stable disease patient, 23-year-old male, saw restoration of normal hemopoiesis, that patient, um, because he was asymptomatic, was also taken to a second transplant, which subsequently put him into a CR as well. I'm going to show you the, the patient that we put into CR for 15 months. And this, I think, is very meaningful. So we started this patient. She's a 57-year-old female out in the remission arm. So she got an allogeneic stem cell transplant from a sibling, and we gave her 
our multi-antigen specific cells to protect her in that remission. And here, we saw the only grade three adverse event that we've ever seen, a grade three elevation of liver enzymes. Well, it turns out this patient accidentally took her oral pain medication twice the night before, and that may have been what caused the elevation of the liver enzymes, but because we couldn't say that that wasn't related to our T-cells, we score this a grade three adverse event related to our T-cells. So in response to those elevated liver enzymes, the doctors give her prednisone. Prednisone is a steroid. What does it do? It abrogates the effect of T-cells, so they flattened our T-cells. And guess what? When they did that, this patient saw a significant relapse. Look at those spinal lesions. That caused a lot of back pain. Those are big spinal lesions caused by the AML. Well, when the liver enzymes went down, the clinicians withdrew the use of prednisone, and our T-cells spontaneously bounced back and put this patient into a significant partial remission. Look, those spinal lesions have mostly disappeared. In fact, she did so well with the rebound of these T-cells that the doctors decided to try to wipe out the residual disease with consolidation therapy. So they gave her a chemotherapy, decitabine. Decitabine, as you know, kills T-cells. And once again, they eliminated our T-cells. And rather than helping her, it hurt. It actually put her into a significant relapse. And you see that those spinal lesions and that back pain came back. Look at the size of those lesions. Well, at that point, we contacted the FDA. They agreed to let us move her from the adjuvant or remission arm of our trial to the active disease arm of the trial. We then gave her a second dose of our T cells that had been frozen, so we did not remanufacture. This was a frozen sample of the same T cells that she had gotten as a maintenance therapy. And when we gave her those T cells in the active disease arm, T cells alone, we sent her into a complete remission that is now durable out to 15 months. I'm told that she's very happy and that she was more concerned about relationship issues when she came in for her last follow-up than she was about AML. That's pretty amazing. So how do we know that these are our T cells? Well, look, every colored bar here represents a, cl a clonal population of T cells. So we confirmed that one, they're tumor specific. Most of these are actually specific for WT1. This was a high WT expressing one, uh, WT1 expressing tumor and that every one of those bars represents a clone of a T-cell that is donor-derived. Those T-cells do not exist in the patient's native T-cell repertoire, so we know that these are our T-cells. Well, beyond that, I'll say that we've got some equally promising results in multiple myeloma, where, once again, we're generating 50% complete response rates for patients with active residual disease after transplant, and we've only seen one patient ever progress on our therapy. So overall, I will tell you, I think that this therapy is game changing. It is considerably less expensive than a CAR-T. It is much simpler to produce than a CAR-T. It requires no genetic modification of T cells. It seems to generate response rates that are as good or superior to competitive CAR-T products with clearly superior durability of those results while generating none of the adverse events and toxicity that we routinely associate with CAR-T cell therapies today. These therapies can be used earlier in treatments and in treatment settings that a CAR-T can't be used in. In my mind, I think that these clinical results are compelling. In fact, I will, I will, say, I will go so far as to say that you know, when you look at these clinical trial results, these results speak for themselves. And I think that it's one of the reasons that you know, we have had the pleasure of welcoming you know, one of the most um, prominent scientific advisory boards in the industry over the course of the last two weeks, Jim Allison, who I consider the father of modern immunotherapy, uh, architect behind the world's first approved cancer immunotherapy, has joined our, our SAB along with Pam Sharma from MD Anderson. Alongside him, Malcolm Brenner, who is a household name within CAR-T. Malcolm, as you know, founded Baylor Cell and Gene Therapy, which I would argue is one of the top five cell therapy institutions in the country, if not in the world. Malcolm, as you know, is the former president of the American Society of uh, Gene and Cell Therapy. Alongside Malcolm, we have the current president of the American Society of Cell and Gene Therapy, Helen Heslop. And we have Cleona Rooney, who did many of the first in-man studies with T-cell therapies. I, I very much am grateful for their support with this new therapy, which I think is very important in moving the field forward. Thank you.